Welcome to Worth Quoting. I'm Mary Sue Keppel, editor of Calliope, a journal of women's art. And with me today is Irene Blair Honeycutt, a poet. Welcome. It is my pleasure that you have come here to, to join us and to be our poet. Irene, you are really wonderful coming back to Jacksonville because my understanding is you were born and raised here in Jacksonville. And that um, now you live in Charlotte, North Carolina. You teach writing and humanities at Central Piedmont Community College. You won an award there for Instructor of the Year. And um, you also teach besides poetry and um, composition and English, you teach general writing. Right. Mm -hmm. So all of this is your background. But welcome back to Jacksonville. How Thank you. You left Jacksonville, as I understand it, after high school, right? Right. I graduated from Paxson High School in um, 1957 and uh, worked for a year at a bank here. And then I went away to college. Well, tell us about growing up in Jacksonville. And I know you came back this weekend. Have you seen great changes? Yes, especially, of course, along the river. My brother, Ronnie, and I went on a boat ride today, and I was just thrilled to see what they're doing there. I think it's beautiful, um, the architecture. And I, f I realized, again, I really like being in a city near water, and I really miss that in Charlotte. But that's the main thing. I really um, haven't been around um, the city uh, very much. Well, tell us about what life was like in Jacksonville when you were growing up. Well, uh, Ronnie and I were remin <laughs> reminiscing this today about that, and uh, we have lots of great memories growing up um, in our little neighborhood. There were lots of woods out back, and now, of course, that's developed. And uh, we played a lot, built palm huts out back, uh, swung across the creeks on vines, and uh, enjoyed going down, walking on Saturdays to the uh, Dixie Theater down on Macduff, which is, I imagine, all boarded up now. Um, we had, you know, there were lots of good memories. We we like to recall that there were some rough times, but um, basically we had a, a good good time. You lived in the west side? Yes. Um, yesterday I was with my niece, and uh, I was eager to come down to the, uh, the river, and she didn't want to. She wanted to walk through the malls. So I asked Ronnie today, I said, well, what do we do? And he said, well, remember, that <laughs> there weren't malls then. So, uh, you know, we went to Dixie Theater, you know, on Saturday mornings. Or we went out into the woods and built huts. and. Uh, so I think in many ways, we, well, we feel we had, a, in a way, a better life than a lot of children growing up now uh, who can't go out in the woods the way we did. But that's our own bias, I guess. Oh, they, sure. They might be we always think life was better <laughs> when we were growing up, but don't, don't we? I mean, um, your book, It Comes as a Dark Surprise, is um, made up in the first half of it, it seems to me, of, of um, poems that come out of your childhood and out of your growing up experiences. And one of those that I love and was even mentioned in the, um, the write-ups of, of you often is the uh, poem called Charlie. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, just to give the audience a flavor of um, the kind of writing that you do, would you mind reading Charlie for us? Uh, no, I'd be glad to. Uh, what page is it? All six. Right. <laughs> yes, Thank you. Six. I'd be glad to. This is actually uh, based on one of my very favorite memories of growing up here and uh, going some, sometimes with my mother. She would drive us to Georgia to visit relatives. And uh, actually, the poem is a combination of different memories. Um, it's not one place, but the poem reads as if it's one place. But it's memories of um, being chased by a rooster. Um, and that actually occurred here at my Aunt Cleo's home. Uh, but somehow when the poem was being written, all this came in together with memories from going to Georgia and being on the farm. So um, I'll read Charlie. <clears throat> At 4 a.m., a rooster crows a city block away. Damp air fills the room. You lie in bed and remember a Georgia morning on the farm. You sat in the back seat of the Green Plymouth reading Burma Shave signs all the way from Jacksonville to Waycross. And when the relatives flocked like birds to the car, you jumped out, ran barefoot past the barbed wire fence down the hot sandy road with your cousin Caroline. The next morning you skimmed the cold plank floor, dashed out the screen door for the fresh silver taste of well water from a tin dipper. 
You hung it on its rusty nail next to the dishcloth and then rushed to the kitchen for the steaming bowl of grits you knew would be there. That was the day Charlie, the barnyard rooster, tore after you. All they did was shout, Charlie's coming, and you ran lickety-split across the yard without glancing backward and leaped to the safety of the front porch while your cousins bent double laughing. You turn your cheek to the cool pillow and stare at the pines stretching into the fog. You'll rise at six, shower and coffee, drive to school with this sudden knowledge, and maybe you'll laugh and tell your class that all your life you've been running from Charlie. The sound in the distance you think you'll always hear after the words have ended. That's a lovely poem about Jacksonville, but it's also a poem very much about you. Mm -hmm. You're the teacher. Mm -hmm. You're the poet. Mm -hmm. You're the person who remembers and the person who, who is um, alone. Alone. Yeah, I, I got that at the end. This feeling that you were yourself in bed having this memory at 4 a.m. Mm -hmm. Remembering. Yes. And the sound yes. in the distance and being mm -hmm. somehow removed from the experience, and yet the experience is very much with you, and it will always be there. It will. The sound mm -hmm. keeps coming on. Mm -hmm. You agree? I agree. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us, please. Um, I understand from this book that you are the winner of the New South Poetry Book Series Contest. Would you tell us about that? Yes, uh, the publisher is Sandstone Publishing, and uh, they are based in Charlotte. And this was their first regional contest, and, and ac actually it was their only regional contest uh, because this year they um, advertised the contest nationally. Um, it was their first book, and they now have five. They're doing a tremendous job. Um, I was really proud of them. Um, it was like a happy marriage. It was their first book, and I was really thrilled that... It, uh, that I won, <laughs> and cool. that they did such a wonderful job with this, too. Sure, sure. When you say it was a regional contest, mm -hmm. poets then from? From uh, mainly uh, North, South Carolina, Virginia, Georgia, Florida, I imagine, entered. It was southern region. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and the poetry, well, the contest is called? Well, the, then it was called the New South Poetry Book Series, and now they have changed the name, I think, to Sandstone's um, poetry book series because they didn't want it to just be a regional contest so they changed it from New South to Sandstone Publishing. And all their books are poetry? So far. So far, mm -hmm. okay. What I got the feeling of as I was reading your book is that the first half of it gives me many, many poems as a reader that come out of your childhood and mm -hmm. experiences that you must have had as a child. And I also found um, some of the poems were fun. Um, the, the references back to Snow White, and yet mm. uh, devastating. Mm -hmm. the, the references to Hansel and Gretel, um, Little Red Riding Hood. Um, can you tell us something about how you go about making a poem? Well, sometimes it begins with... Um, you know, definitely a feeling and a particular mood. It's not like I can consciously sit down and say, oh, I think I'll write about Hansel and Gretel. But um, some of the, the fairy tale poems, well, actually I teach a course in fairy tales, classic fairy tales. It's a course I developed several years ago. And the poems, um, little, the one, The Little Red Syndrome and The Oven Story That May Never Be Told, actually grew out of an idea that came to me when I was discussing the fairy tales in class, and sometimes a student's question might prompt a poem because I'll think, hmm, and I'll think about it after I get home and then write. So, uh, yeah, several of the poems in here that uh, have the fairy tale theme grew out of the classroom experience that would plunge me into memory, especially um, the little red syndrome um, brought back a memory of. Do you want me to read that one? That would be fun. Yes. Um, it's. It's an interesting poem from my standpoint, um, memory, because it's also, it brings back a, what could have been um, a very frightening, uh, well, tragic outcome. I survived, obviously I'm here. But you know, of course, in, uh, depending upon which version of Little Red you read uh, in the 
Poirot version, she gets devoured, the wolf just destroys her and that's it. But in the Grimm version, she survives. And one of my students asked in class one day, well, if um, when Little Red goes up to Grandmother's cottage and sees the door ajar, um, it's almost as if she senses something's wrong, so why did she go in? And I thought, hmm, good question. And then suddenly, I, it, right there in class, I remembered when I was a little girl going to uh, first grade, walking down Lowell Avenue, going to Annie R. Morgan Elementary School. So the poem uh, is framed, actually. The first part of the poem is uh, me in the classroom responding to the students. And then the middle of the poem is my flashback to this memory of being in the first grade going to school. And then the poem circles around, as I said, it's framed, really, uh, and comes back to the classroom. So I'll read this. And uh, the poem has a head note from DeJuna Barnes, Nightwood, in which uh, she says, children know something they cannot tell. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's quite profound, too, how many times. It's, it's an interesting thing to think about, all the things we never told anybody when we were little. Okay. The Little Red Syndrome. <clears throat> Children know something they can't tell. Today in class, a student asked why, if Little Red Cap felt uneasy upon finding Grandmother's door ajar, she entered anyway. Was it mere naivete or the lure of the wolf? She should have known better, right? She should have followed intuition, yet all her senses quickened, the flowers, butterflies, nuts, no longer engaging. She focused on big ears, eyes, hands, mouth. Devoured in Perot, rescued in Grimm, she redeemed herself, placed stones strategically, vowed never again to stray from the path. That she learned from her experience is surely the point, the necessity for the Grimm sequel. But her departure, too, was essential. All the while I am responding, I rerun a scene from childhood. I am in the first grade, skipping along the sidewalk one sunny morning, lunchbox in hand. A man in a pickup truck beckons. Little girl, would you like a ride to school? I know that I should refuse. My mother has warned me not to accept rides from strangers, yet I feel sorry for him, such a nice man. So I consent, climb into the truck. He hands me a butterfinger. I clutch it tight, my eyes riveted not on ears, hands, or teeth, but street signs, Lowell Avenue, Mackinac, Superior. Commonwealth finally comes into view. He breaks to a slow stop. I thank him for the ride, scurry to the safety of the playground. If it happens again, I'll say no, I tell myself, as I toss a rock into the hopscotch square under the oak. The school bell rings. I enter homeroom, drop the candy into the trash can. I never told my mother. Can we see the wolf and hunter as two aspects of one, seducer and rescuer, the student probes? I think of the man in the pickup truck and wonder why he let me go. Glad he did. No, oh, we're glad he did. My goodness. <laughs> what an experience. <laughs> but but you're saying as a teacher that oftentimes what the students bring up in class will trigger the memories that right. end up in the poems. Yes. Tell me, um, if you would, please, It Comes as a Dark Surprise is a wonderful kind of title. And I remember that mm -hmm. I called someone to say that we were going to have this um, workshop with you or, or this interview. And she said, what a wonderful title. We all have those dark surprises that come welling up out of our, our psyches or our, mm -hmm. our backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that that's perhaps where you got the title from. Yes, it really um, grew out of my experience with um, going into counseling um, as the child of an alcoholic um, several years ago. And I had a wonderful therapist that encouraged me to write uh, she would often say, um, go home and, and write about this and then bring what you write. So I would go home and just write you know, for hours. And uh, actually, this poem grew out of um, that whole therapeutic experience. It was um, one of the last poems I wrote right before um, the therapy 
was terminated at the end of about, a, I think, a, a year, maybe a little over a year. And uh, I dedicated it to uh, Nancy Dorier. Uh, at the time, she's a business consultant now, but I'm really glad she was there for me. Um, the, do, would you like for me to read this Absolutely. one? Absolutely. Um, this is my favorite poem of the entire book. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that. And uh, Fred Chapel, I might as well say. Oh, sure. <laughs> he wrote me a wonderful letter and said it was his favorite also. And uh, I really um, meant it as a tribute to um, Nancy, as I said. Um, I, um, the title itself refers to something that occurred during one of the last sessions after, as I said, about a year of counseling and having to recall a lot of painful memories and writing about those. Um, and I remember toward the end of um, the year, I said, you know, I've worked through so many things and uh, really feel great about it, but I feel, still feel sad. And I'll always remember, she looked at me and she said, Irene, you know, part of you will always be sad. And it was just like a, a revelation, but it was also a relief and a release because I felt that somehow I was going to get rid of this. But how can you be happy about painful and sad memories? Um, there's nothing joyful about, you know, having a mother who's an alcoholic. You feel a lot of compassion for her. I do now. But, um, so that was the dark surprise. Um, it comes as a dark surprise. And yet, I think the poem uh, suggests that it's part of the journey, the odyssey that we're all on if we are wanting to grow. So, um, I was sitting on the back porch when I wrote this, and um, the gardenia bush was blooming. So you'll see how that image comes into the poem, too. It comes as a dark surprise, this blossom that sprouts from the ground of your childhood. After a year's upheaval of digging roots long buried, watering them with tears until you thought in a moment you could drown swimming through shadows. When you rose to a clearing this spring, you expected lightness of being. Blue chicory salutes, a bluebird to light on your hand, anything but the familiar morning doves and this black orchid of sadness, bitter root to sweeten your tea. Yet no one understands even the cicada's mysterious odyssey, how it spends its time 17 years underground before it explodes into cacophonous sound, abandons its skin, writes its final passage from dawn until dusk. Even as you read this, something presses toward the light. When it surfaces, it will drown out the cicada's frenzied calls, the lonesome question the burrowing owl raises long into the night. It will have the fragrance of Cape Jasmine. I wanted to ask you about the poem. Um, when you say that, I, as I understand it, the ending is very positive, the fragrance, right. the mm -hmm. fragrance of Cape Jasmine. Tell me about that. About Cape Jasmine and, and the positiveness that you see. Well, it's, I see life as a journey. Mm -hmm. And that I think we need to uh, be brave enough, courageous enough to confront the darkness. And uh, there were days um, each week when I was in therapy for that year, it was like the very day of therapy. I would be driving to work and I would start crying. I would dread going in because mm -hmm. I knew I was going to dredge this up, um, the painful things. But I think you have to go through the fire to come out on the other side. And it's exciting, too, because I think we learn and uh, I see life as, uh, as I said, a journey. And there's that, um, the positive image that uh, is like a blossom and that we really can't appreciate anything, I think, without the shadows, too. Mm -hmm. Like art has to have shadow. You look at a tree and you have to have shadows to see the leaves. So that's, does that answer your question? Absolutely. Uh, I just wanted to hear you talk about it. And thank you. <laughs> You also are a journal keeper, a journal teacher. Would you talk a little bit about that? People who might be interested in knowing how journal writing has um, given you things to write about or why they might want to keep a journal themselves, right? even if they're not writers. I think um, journal writing is a wonderful way to honor your life. I think um, when you, it's a way of paying tribute to the little details of Great our lives. I like what Annie Dillard says, too, that, um, that we are put here to give voice to what astonishes us. And I think of a journal as a way of recording 
all of that. Um, to say, as uh, Natalie Goldberg stresses in her book, Writing Down the Bones, that um, everything is important. It's important to say that, yes, I lived here. Mm -hmm. I walked down Laurel Avenue. I went to Dixie Theater. Um, I was walking in the fields. I built palm huts. Whatever we did, this is important. And um, so, you know, just on that level, and I think it is a way of uh, raising our consciousness uh, it's a way of helping us see. Sometimes I think we go through the day and we haven't even seen. Sometimes one of my favorite exercises when I uh, have the journal writing class is to uh, say, let's warm up with, uh, write about um, today I was alive to, and they usually say, what? <laughs> what were you alive to today? Um, so a journal writing, I think, can help us to see, to become more observant, and uh, as I said, to honor our lives, the fact that we are here. What's the difference between a journal and a uh, diary? Or I've seen that? so many different ways of looking at that. Um, my own way of uh, explaining this to my students is uh, I personally see the diary as just an account of, okay, today I went to AMP, or uh, I watched two hours of TV, or I went to the library, just a record. Mm -hmm. And I think of a journal as uh, reflections more, uh, maybe capturing certain images. It's more. Um, thought-provoking, has emotions, feeling, experience, but with some, some degree of reflection. When you, as a writer, have your journal at your fingertips, do you actually page through the journal to find ideas to write about, or is, is once you've finished something in your journal, is it over? Do you put it away in the attic? Uh, it's over for a while, and uh, well, this summer, I'm working on a poem now um, about my niece, Lori. Uh, she comes to visit me in the summers up in Charlotte, and we go to the mountains, and she is writing little poems now. And, uh, but actually, this, the poem um, was inspired by something that happened several years ago in the mountains when she, she came to visit. And this past summer, I was going through old journals and just came across this little journal entry about her writing a poem. And I sat down and I thought, oh, I want to do something with this. So um, you never know. I th as I said, I think the, a journal is like a storage place, too. And um, so some, it makes me want to go. I wish I had the time to go back and just spend maybe a whole summer with journals, old journals, and picking out images and um, thoughts. Again, for me, it's not something I can force. Uh, there was something about that particular journal entry, but the great thing is that I, if I had not recorded it, I might have forgotten it. Sure, so it's gone. there, which is one of the greatest values of keeping a journal, I think. You preserve something that's worth keeping. Absolutely. Before we go, um, I, I found another whole kind of poem that was in here <laughs> besides those that came out of your childhood and those perhaps that come out of your journal. There is another kind of poem that comes out of your travel. Mm -hmm. And um, you um, suggested perhaps that you might want to read Remembering Delphi. And I'd love for you to read that to us. Um, I found mine on page 32. All right. Um, this was an exciting poem for me. It was really one of the most inspired poems um, after I went to, to Greece. Um, I came back and I found it. When I would talk about the trip, I would say, I really enjoy going to Delphi. And friends wondered, well, what was different about that? And I really could not articulate it. And I kept trying to write the poem, but it took a long time. And then I wrote a letter, and it triggered these images. So um, in writing the poem, I discovered primarily that the sounds captivated me. So I will read this. Uh, how much time do we have? Do I need to? Hurry the reading. Why don't you pick your favorite stanza out of it? All right. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> you do remember stepping off the tourist bus and seeing the oleanders brilliant in the sun before you heard the grass begin to sing as you wound your way up the sacred path to Apollo's shrine. And cypress trees stiff in the wind pointed to the stark cliffs, triumphant backdrop to these ancient ruins crumbling still beneath your sandaled feet. Then the locusts rang in your ears with such urgency that you shuddered, and the wind moaned, 
and you could almost swear you heard slaves' voices rising from the walls, imploring you to remember what you never knew before you came there. It's a wonderful way to end, because I think that's exactly what these poems did for me. They gave me the sense that you were writing out of what you never knew before you actually wrote it, and then when you wrote it, you you became the gift bearer to all the rest of us because we got Thank to you. share it with you. Thank and you. I appreciate your coming this afternoon to, to share with us in the city of Jacksonville where it's you were an born and grew up. to be invited to be here. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a conversation with Irene Blair Honeycutt. I'm Mary Sue Keppel, and this is worth quoting. Thank you for joining us, Jacksonville. <laughs>